it's just wonderful to see such global representation in the chat box. So many of you are joining from different time zones and different places throughout the world. And I think that speaks to the importance of the, the topic that we're going to be covering today. Data today is, is pervasive. It's, it's prevalent. It's everywhere. It's in our personal lives. It's in our professional lives. So often we're taught how to gather data, data how to analyze data. Um, but today we're going to focus on a, a sometimes missing link to that, and that's how to use data to um, be a better visual data storyteller and how to persuade with data. Uh, we've run these programs as kind of a short introduction to a lot of the material that we cover here at Sloan. And today I'm delighted to, uh, to share with you that we'll be joined by Miro Kazakov, a senior lecturer here at MIT Sloan and the managerial, communi managerial communications group to really provide us with some insight on his frameworks and research that he's done here at MIT and that he teaches ex uh, extensively here at MIT. Miro, as you'll see, is a senior lecturer, as I said, in managerial communications here at Sloan. Here at Sloan, he's developed MIT's communicating and persuading with data courses. We were delighted a few years ago when Miro approached us in executive education to see about or to inquire about teaching these topics that have been so successful with the, the graduate students and students here at MIT Sloan to our executives that participate in our many programs that run throughout the year, both on the MIT campus and online as well. One thing that you don't see in Miro's bio, bio here is that he's also received numerous awards for his teaching here at MIT. His classes are always uh, well subscribed. Uh, there's a waiting list often and the, and the programs that he's done for us here in executive education have been equally uh, successful in terms of really providing our learners with, with new frameworks and ideas on how they can become better at communicating with data and persuading with data. Miro also is the author of a relatively new book, Persuading with Data, a guide to designing and delivering and defending your data. And one thing that struck me uh, earlier this morning, I spent just a little bit of time looking at some of the reviews both for the book that, that Miro authored and for his program here at MIT Sloan. And I see a recurring theme that this information is helpful to everyone, whether it's somebody that's starting out in their career, is mid-career or even later stage career. So much is changing with how we use data. The, the research that Miro has done and the way that he teaches it is useful, I think, for all of us. So we have a lot of material to cover. One last request from you is that you can be as engaged as you can. I know that Miro appreciates your questions throughout the program. We'll hopefully have a little bit of time at the end of the session, but don't wait for that. If you have a question, use the Q&A box and submit your question, and we'll be able to, to hopefully uh, acknowledge that question and answer it during the, during the next hour or so. So again, without any uh, further delay, it's my pleasure to introduce Miro Kazakov for today's webinar. Miro, over to you. Excellent. Thank you so much, Rob. Thank you for such a gracious uh, introduction. It's fun to hear nice things said about yourself, and I'm so glad uh, we have so many people joining us here today. We're going to talk today about four foundational tactics for better visual storytelling. There's so many things you can do with data, and particularly how we think about visualizing data, but I've picked out four today that I think are sort of the highest return on investments. They're both foundational concepts, but also actual tactics that you can use and apply in your work. Uh, and also sometimes people wonder um, when I do that video transition, they're like, oh, is he live? I am live. Uh, hi, uh, Willie, who's joining us from El Salvador. Fabrizio, who's joining us from Brazil over in the chat. I am, I am actually here live. And I've designed this presentation for questions. So please, Share your questions, anything on any topic at any time. This is a presentation really designed for this. And so I'm gonna start off going through, well, what are the four foundational things you'll be able to learn by the end of our talk today? And actually, before I do that, um, I showed it here, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna show it again, um, which is I have an image here. And actually, since we have access to chat, if folks go over to chat and don't overthink this, what are you seeing right here? Um, just go and describe what, um, what you're seeing in this. This is an image here. It's not meant to be a complex image. Great, thanks for everyone coming in. You're seeing flowers, people are writing rows, really consistent and fast. This is an image that is easy to decode. 
Decoding is the process of taking incoming information, either in the form of light waves that hit our eyes or sound waves that hit our ears, and translating that information into ideas in our brain. This is not an actual rose. This is an image that encodes the idea of a rose. And what I want to point out to you is the way we encode information is not quite the same as the information itself. It's not an actual rose. And so when we communicate about data, part of what we're choosing is how do we encode information? I do want to point out here that no one has noticed the image of the dolphin that is pictured in this rose. And maybe as you've sort of seen this image before, you might see it, maybe wondering where it is here. I'm gonna zoom in. Um, and maybe now that I've primed you, you can see it a little bit better on here. But if you can't, I'm gonna go ahead and show it to you. Here we go, right here. And then we'll go back and then I'll show it again. All right. What I want you to notice is that now that I've shown it to you, you cannot unsee this dolphin in this image. That is something called, or it illustrates something called the curse of knowledge. The curse of knowledge is the phenomenon that once we know something, not in the sense of like having memorized it, we forget things that we memorized all the time. But once we know something in the sense of having internalized it, we forget what it was like to not know that thing. We have the curse of knowledge of the things that we know. And I start with this because recognizing the curse of knowledge is very, very important to communicating about data to other people. Because once you have analyzed your data, once you've been through the whole process of doing the analysis and creating like the graphs or the slides of that data, you must remember that you're afflicted by this curse of knowledge. And it's hard for you to see things from the audience point of view. And as a result of that, this is something that happens to all people. We often, without realizing it, don't communicate well. We don't encode our information clearly because we can't see our own curse of knowledge. And that curse happens fast, as fast as I showed you the image of the dolphin that's here inside of this image. So even spending 10 minutes looking at a data analysis could mean that someone who looks at it for the first time and only spends 30 seconds on it, you've spent an order of magnitude more time thinking about that. So that's enough time for the curse of knowledge to affect you. It's persistent. I've been using this image for years and people see the dolphin in here years later. And it's pernicious. It gets worse over time. The more you know about a topic, the worse the curse of knowledge is. The more you know, the harder it is for you to be able to recognize what it was like, what it's like to not know that thing. So those of you who've spent years and even decades in a field, remember that your ability to see how someone new to this field views the data is actually very difficult. So Rob's, we have a question from uh, Rob here. And Rob asks, does the curse of knowledge increase over time or as an individual learns more and has more expertise to draw from? Yes, exactly it does. The deeper your expertise gets on a topic, the worse the curse of knowledge is. And so it's a great question. Again, I invite more questions about this. Anything that occurs to you as we go through. And so I brought out today four tactics that are really designed to help fight this curse of knowledge, to help make sure that you're creating data and visualizations that fight, fight the curse of knowledge. We have a couple of logistical questions about will the recording be available to attendees later? It, uh, I believe it will be, we'll talk about that at the end. And Leela, you have a question about, is it an embedded as part of our compound knowledge? If you could just give me a little bit more context on that. That'll be helpful for me to answer that question. While you're doing that, other people are adding in. I'll just give a preview of the topics that we're going to go through today. So four tactics. We're going to talk about the importance of identifying the point and writing it out as a headline. We're going to talk about the, why it's critical to aim for one idea at a time, why it's so hard to do this. 
talk about maximizing the data ink ratio. We'll talk about what that is, a really important rule of thumb concept that's gonna help improve your design and your clarity. And finally, the importance of visualizing all comparisons explicitly. I'm on a quest um, to get this adopted as a best practice. Um, and so I will, I will continue that here. So let's talk first about the importance of identifying the point and writing it as a headline. But first, a conversation from, a point from Teresa that I often get. And she asks, it can't always be a curse. Is it knowing something a blessing? What's the difference? It is not bad to know things. Far from it. It is wonderful to know things. What's important is that you remember that when you know things, the curse comes when you try to explain them to other people. The curse is that it is hard for us to understand what it's like to not know all the things that we know. So it's hard for an it is hard for an audience to know what it's like. It is hard for us to know what it is like for the audience. It doesn't mean it's bad to know things, but it does mean that when you're talking to an audience that doesn't know what you know, you have to pause and think really carefully about how you're explaining things. And the way that you might instinctively explain things to people is actually likely to not be clear because of this curse, because you see patterns in the information that aren't clear to the audience until you point it out to them. And often we don't realize this is happening because the people we talk to every day often know roughly the same things that we know. The person who works in the same group as you and who works with you every day probably knows the same information that you do. And so you don't see this curse because they have the same knowledge that you do. Where it really shows up is when you're talking to people who don't know what you know. Those people might be senior executives in your company. Those people might be customers or clients or external stakeholders. They're going to be people who don't see this information as often as you do. And that's where these, these tactics will really help you make sure that you're being clear for those kinds of audiences. Information is a blessing. The curse is when we try to explain it to others. Keep them coming, folks. So let's talk about identifying the point and writing it out as a headline. So this is, this is as close as we have to a joke in data visualization, which is that pie charts can look like other things. In this case, the percentage of pie charts um, that look like Pac-Man. And up here, up in this space, up at the top of the slide, there is some text. This text labels what we're seeing. It just says, oh, this is a distracting pie chart. Uh, an example of another label might be things like revenue. One of the biggest change is that I would encourage you to make is to think instead of labeling your data, to use this space at the top of slides to put in a headline. And a headline is actually a short sentence that explains the point of the data. It doesn't just say what it is. The place for that is the title of the graph. It says What's the point we should take from the data? So for example, if this said revenue last year, that would be a label. It's a headline when it says revenue is increasing or revenue is decreasing. Identifying the point of your slide and writing it at the top of your slide is one of the single biggest things that you can do that will make your presentations clearer to other people. And then I'll get to the question from Dorov in a moment here. So if you're wondering whether or not you have a headline at the top of your slide, the test of whether or not you have a headline is does it have a verb in it? It doesn't have to be a complicated verb. That verb might just be the word is. Revenue is declining is a headline. But if you have verbs, that's a good test that your slides have headlines to it. And so headlines pass the verb test. And if you start the discipline 
of putting headlines at the top of your slides, you can create presentations that pass the narrative test. And the narrative test is the test that if you were to just read the headlines of a presentation, you didn't look at all what was on the slide, if you were just to read the headlines, that the presentation would make sense and the flow would be clear. And ideally, if you agreed with all of those statements, that you'd agree with the key takeaway of the headline. So good slides have headlines that pass the verb test and presentation, and that allows you to create presentations that pass the narrative test. So there's some uh, questions coming in. Um, quickly on the dolphin rose, Durov asks, is it normal that I can still see the rose without the dolphin figure? Yeah, it's normal to be able to see both. Mask asks, Max asks, what about the implications for the audience in the headline? What I think Mask is asking about here is, should a headline discuss implications for the audience of this data? Max, if that is not what you're asking, please chime in more. Um, similarly, uh, Max has added more here about creating a story. So ideally, what good headlines do is they describe the data really clearly so that an audience can look at the headline and look at the data and say, yes, this data supports that headline. Hopefully that can have an implication for the audience. What you wanna be careful about doing is not creating headlines that go past the data on the slide. So for instance, a headline might say revenue is declining. That's a headline. But showing a graph that just shows declining revenue and putting a headline that says, we need to spend more money on advertising. That's a headline but it goes beyond the data on the slide. You actually need more data in order to support that headline. And so really be careful about picking headlines that describe the data, and it's gonna help make sure you're not making logical leaps. Russell points out uh, that he was always trained to put the headline of the bottom of the slide as the takeaway, since it's the last thing that someone reads. Um, and he's thinking, oh, maybe I've been wasting space that is somewhat um, meaningless topical description of the slides. So Russell, this is an interesting point. And the research actually says that people will look for things wherever they're trained to look for things. So in some organizations, people put the headline at the bottom of the slide. And if everyone knows to look for it there, great. Then they'll know to look for it there. In general, you should remember that when we're reading slides, People actually take lots of different paths throughout the slides, but roughly top to bottom and left to right is how most people read. And so putting the most important information in the biggest font in the place where people start also makes a lot of sense. I think this tendency to wanna to put this information at the bottom of the slide comes from some idea of really wanting to have this big ta-da moment for the audience at the end. And that might work if anyone was paying attention to you. And so I, I teach in a classroom here at MIT Sloan, and I have lots of good evidence that even if people are in a room with you, and even if you have a rule that prevents them from having other devices, and even if they are looking straight at you, that there is no guarantee that they are paying attention to you. And indeed, there's a lot of people right now watching this who are not paying attention to me. You have six other screen things on your screen at best, four of them are certainly more interesting than I am. So especially in this really distracted age, I would encourage you to think about using this space for the most important information. I'm gonna keep going with these headlines because this is a really important topic and we're spending a lot of time on it. Um, Felicia asks, um, will they not remember only the headline but nothing else? And Felicia, to that I'll say, if the headline is the key thing that they should take away from this slide. And that is the only thing that they remember, then that's actually a victory. Then you've done really well. I believe that if an audience walks out of the presentation and they don't remember any of the graphs that they saw, any of the visuals that they saw, but they know what to do differently in their work because you've helped inform them, then that presentation is a great success. If an audience walks out and thinks that was really pretty and they remember the graphs, 
but they don't remember what they should do, then actually that's not a great presentation, even if it was really, really, really pretty. What practices would you recommend in terms of headlines for dashboards when the data changes constantly? Ah, we're gonna to talk today mostly about slides with static visualizations on them. Some of the rules for dashboards are different. I'll try to call those out. For dashboards, it's very hard to have headlines because headlines only apply to a specific instance of the data. And so the data keeps changing. For those of you who create dashboards, an important thing to keep in mind when you're making the dashboard is to make sure that this data could generate a headline and to think about what kinds of headlines it would generate to make sure that every view on the dashboard actually serves a purpose. Often we create dashboards that have data that's easy to view because we have access to it, but it's actually not clear what decisions it would impact or what the point of it would be. So be disciplined when you're designing your dashboards, even if you don't write the headlines, to be able to think about what a headline would be. And at the highest level, I have seen dynamic dashboards where there's sort of a headline format and it actually does read the data and changes the text on the top of it. So that is a way to think of it. Um, so the headline with a verb essentially tells the audience up front that there's a dolphin in the rows. Mike asked this, yes. That's what the headline would do. And you'd think, oh, well, you're giving away the whole point of the slide. And again, I think that is a thing you wanna think about in a world where people are not actually paying attention. That in a world where people are not paying attention, you wanna think about telling them what the point is so that they can confirm it. I pull the dolphin and rose thing here because I think it's a fun trick that I can get your attention for like 10 seconds on. I don't do it throughout the presentation. I think you'll see every other slide in this presentation, I believe has a headline. Um, Drew is pointing out that he's listening to two other webinars simultaneously. Thank you, Drew, for your honesty. And Colleen has said, um, if we provide the key takeaway, um, why add anything else? Seems like it will be redundant. Again, these are all on the theme of assuming that your audience is paying attention and that they're really highly invested in your work. And I would say the premise you should start from is that assume no one is paying attention ever. And that what it is your job to do is to give them clarity and to transmit information as efficiently as possible. I'm gonna do three more and then we're gonna move on just for time purposes. So Marco says, we usually have slides, presentation that makes data slides and other kinds of slides. Um, would you recommend this for all of them? What I would recommend for all of them is that you write a headline, that you have a headline in, your, in mind for each slide. I don't always think you need to write it. If the graph is a picture, then maybe you don't need to, but you should always have one in mind to know what the point is. There's also the comment here, aren't we trained to give evidence before drawing a conclusion? I love these questions. We are trained in school to give evidence before drawing a conclusion. And good science presents the evidence before drawing a conclusion. One of the fundamental differences of business communication is what business communication tends to focus on in most cultures is efficiency, transmitting information as efficiently as possible. And providing the point clearly is a much more efficient way to transmit information. And some of you may be in environments where efficiency is not the primary goal, but in most organizations, especially as you move more senior, focusing on efficiency is typically the goal. And so being clear about this will help. For some of these other ones that we're not gonna have a chance to get to today, we'll tackle them afterwards. I'm just gonna go through and scan a couple of other ones here. Are we humans drawn to the charts versus the headlines first? All right. So I'll do this one and we'll go to the next one. The research on this actually says that people take totally different paths through the slots. Some people look at the graph first, some people look at the text first. It's actually quite heterogeneous. Different people are starting in different places, which is why actually having 
your graph and your point in different places will help different members of the audience be clear because you actually don't know where people are going to start. It's very, very different person to person, and there's not a common path. And then Victor asked me if there's a single tool to do this. And the answer is there are lots of great tools changing all the time. There is no one magic tool for this. The key is to understand the principles. So identify the point and write it out as a headline. Here's the next one. It's also gonna to be tough for people, which is one of the best practices to begin doing, and this is hard to do, is to aim for one idea at a time. It turns out audiences, they can handle more than one idea but only one idea at a time. And so let me illustrate this. I'm gonna put this up here. And what I'll do is zoom in and I'll ask folks, try to count the number of nines that are here on this field. It's taken a while um, and you may not be able to find it quickly. I'm gonna make exactly two changes here. And let's see if that changes your ability to count the nines. Here we go. Yeah. Nice job, Joseph. Almost no one gets that. It's very hard to get. But now you can probably see it really quickly. There is a single nine on this page. And the two changes that I made are that I changed the color of the nines, so it was different than the others, and that I reduced in intensity. Here, if I go back, you'll see it again. I reduced everything else in intensity to foreground one idea at a time. The audience can only see one thing at a time. Notice if I color in lots of different numbers, not only is it harder to see the different numbers, the nine actually doesn't stand out as much. So a best practice rule is to try and aim for one idea per slide. This is really hard for people often to be able to see, to, to have that discipline because we often have limits on the number of slides we can put in presentations. I want to point out fundamentally, the reason you have, and leaders ask you to have limits on the number of slides in a presentation is that there's a limited number of ideas an audience can handle in a 20 minute, half an hour, one hour presentation. And putting on slide limits is an attempt to try to limit the number of ideas. The way people get around this is then they say, okay, well, if I can only have 10 slides, I'm gonna put five ideas on every slide and I'm gonna talk faster. And that doesn't actually solve the problem because it still puts this overload on the audience. If you have 50 points to make in a presentation, you should be thinking about a 50 slide deck. And if you don't have time for 50 slides, you should be thinking about what ideas am I going to cut? Because there's not time for that many ideas because the audience can only see one idea at a time. I'll also point out just something else here as a side note on visual design is notice part of the way I made the nine more prominent was by fading out all of the other numbers. This is a way you can often retain complexity and still focus the audience on one point at a time. Often what we do instead is we sort of circle the nine and draw a giant arrow at it and try to add more visual elements to the page. Think instead about taking things away in order to foreground the idea and still having some degree of complexity. So Javier points out, is this why storytelling is crucial to attract our audience attention? We're guiding them to what we wanna put our attention on. Part of what storytelling does is that storytelling sequences ideas in order so that the ideas are clearly connected and that one idea generates the next idea in an order that forms a story. So part of why storytelling is helpful is because it creates a structure that is easier for people to follow one idea at a time rather than 10 ideas at once. Nazar asks, what about the idea that ideas feed from other ideas? Absolutely. It is critical that ideas feed from other ideas. It's not that the audience can only handle one idea. It's that they can only handle one idea at a time. They can handle more than one. You just want to think about sequencing them. Um, and then Rob surfaces this uh, 
a question from Francisco, which is if the same idea takes several slides to explore, do you use the same headline for each slide? And actually, one of the ways to do this is no, is to actually think about using the same idea and changing the headline each time. And I often see this done. Imagine you have a graph that actually has multiple points you can make on. Think about repeating the graph, a different headline for each point, and then using that to help inform this visual. Maybe you make one point where you highlight the nine, and then you move on to another point where you highlight all the eights, and then you highlight the twos, and then you would be changing the headline each time. So you can use multiple, um, you can use make multiple points with the same graph. You just have to make them one at a time. Yes, Keith, it is a matter of focus. This is the big thing. And this is why there's essentially this war between people who create slides and people who consume them. And the, the people who consume slides want to reduce the amount of, they want to increase the clarity so that it's easier for them to understand to increase their efficiency. And those who create slides because of the curse of knowledge often wanna push as much information as possible at the audience. More information does not mean more better. It's often scary because we've done all this hard work and we wanna demonstrate the audience, to, we want to demonstrate to the audience our hard work. Think about trying to be effective through the clarity of your ideas, not the volume of your ideas. More ideas doesn't mean more better. Clearer ideas means more better. Um, please address the difference between a live presentation deck and a deck that will be passed along, perhaps to people who did not attend the presentation. This is a great point and a question that comes from Dickinson. So in my world, we actually separate this out into two words to illustrate these. In the world of management communications, when you think about a presentation, you are talking about something that is designed to be presented with a speaker and it acts as a visual aid. Something that's designed to be read by the audience without a speaker, we call that a document. And what's confusing is that in the modern era, we do both of these in PowerPoint. What you should know is that these are very different purposes that have very different rules. For things that are presented, we have to be very careful about not overwhelming the audience because we need everyone to move through the presentation at the same pace. And we're there to answer questions. For things that are designed to be read, the audience can decide their own pace when they're reading alone. So they can move forward and backward. They can choose how they're absorbing the information and there's no one there to explain it. So documents need to be much more what's called data dense. More points, more ideas put in more densely. And the problem comes when you try to make one thing do both of these. For time purposes, you will all do this all the time. You'll create one file that is designed to serve both purposes. But what I want you to know from today is that there is a cost to doing that. There is a cost of clarity when you try to take the document designed to be read and present it, and vice versa when you take the presentation one. And just trade off that cost against the time cost that it takes to make two different presentations. If you're going to present to the board of directors, you're gonna take the time to make something that is specifically designed for that environment. Or if you're giving a TED talk, if you're just moving from one meeting to the next quickly, maybe you're not gonna take the time to make two different versions of it. But know that that has a cost and just be deliberate about it. Question from Brian that asks, how can I apply the one idea at a time approach to a graph with multiple related sets of data points, i.e. cell growth, nutrition, consumption, and product expression? So let's say you have a situation where you have multiple bits of data that are related. The first question to ask yourself is, assuming this is a presentation, is ask yourself, does the audience need to see all of this data together in order to get the point? So it actually starts from what is the point? What is the headline that you're gonna write? 
And sometimes you'll need two graphs together or even three to be able to support that point. Often that's the case when the graphs share an axis. So maybe they were all measured over the same time frame, or maybe it's three different um, compounds all measured against the same scale. If you need to see them together in order to make one point, then that is clearly one slide. And you just wanna think carefully about that. But if not, and there's actually three different points and you're just used to putting them together, consider separating them. And it looks, yeah, and Brian here has a similar question um, about the one, yeah, one at a time approach is appearing in multiple places. Okay, so one idea at a time. Let's actually take a look at, well, how does that apply to an example? So I've got this example here. Um, this is for a hypothetical ice cream shop. And what this compares is this looks at the average daily temperature um, for a single summer last year versus the sales volume that that ice cream shop did in that day. So for example, here on this day, um, right down here where the temperature was about 57 degrees, the shop sold about two or $3,000 on that particular day. And there's actually multiple points that this graph could make. And this is where it's really helpful to think about what is the headline? What is the point that you wanna make? So one version of this data is this one. And so if you think about, well, what would be the headline for this one? I've added a best fit line here. And the headline here would probably emphasize that ice cream sales are correlated with temperature. As the temperature gets higher, or days with higher temperature, on days with higher temperatures, this ice cream shop tends to sell more ice cream. There are other points you could make with this exact same graph. For instance, here what I've done is I've increased the focus on these days and I've labeled them. And perhaps the point you might make here is that you can explain the outliers with specific events. This was Memorial Day weekend. There was a tropical storm here that led to lower sales. Over on the high end, there was a music festival that came through that day that increased ice cream sales. It's an example of one graph here that has two different points. And you wanna think about making the points one at a time for the audience. If they were just reading the deck, you could probably have both of these points simultaneously because people would have time to go through it. So think about what your headline is in order to think about how to apply it. Because after you've seen them, then it's a lot easier for the audience to take in all of them at once. And this version here shows both the best fit lines and the outlier points and uses an intensity to sort of show where we should focus. This one focuses much more on the main thread here. And I've made these outliers just a little bit lighter to decrease their visual focus so that there's not two points competing as much for attention. So think about aiming for one idea at a time. Doesn't mean only one idea in the presentation. Doesn't even mean one idea per graph. It just means one at a time. Next principle, maximize the data ink ratio. This is a term um, coined by Edward Tufte. Uh, many of you have heard of Edward Tufte because he's the only person people have heard of in data visualization. And Edward Tufte coined this idea. Uh, Edward Tufte wrote a book in 1984 called The Visual Display of Quantitative Information that really sort of reset the stage in data visualization. And he came up with this rule of thumb that is based on an idea that you should think of every pixel on this slide as ink. And some of that ink is data ink. It's a mark that conveys information to the audience. And some of that ink is non-data ink. It actually doesn't convey information to the audience. And there's not um, a rigorous definition of what divides data ink from non-data ink, which has made it difficult to sort of experimentally verify this, but I still find it such a useful concept for people to help increase the quality of their slides. I'll give you an example of things that are often non-data ink. Depends on the context, but often. Backgrounds are often examples of non-data ink. Meaningless icons, so icons that don't actually add any clarity. If the icons are meaningful, maybe they're data ink, but meaningless icons. Excess color, 
is a good example of non-data ink. If the colors don't add anything or divide the data into categories. Grid lines are often non-data ink on presentation slides. Shadows, here's my rule. There's no reason why your data needs to float ever so slightly above the page. So save the shadows for a time where it's appropriate for something to float above the page, like a note that's on top of the page. 3D effects, I've got another rule. Two-dimensional data, two-dimensional graphs. Save the 3D for the three-dimensional for the three-dimensional data. Boxes around things that don't need boxes. And so your goal is to optimize data ink and eliminate non-data ink. And overall to maximize this ratio, to maximize the ratio of data ink to total ink. So some questions have come in from Keith, who asks how much of the presentation success hinges on the presenter and their personal appeal versus the content of your presentation. Another way of asking this that sometimes people ask is, hey, if I'm not a great presenter, can I still deliver a good presentation? And the answer to this is complicated. Here's the basic one. If it is clear to the audience why this information matters to them in their life, to decisions they need to make, and if the stakes are high, the audience will invest the time needed. So the most important thing you can do, regardless of your quality as a presenter, is to get clear about why this matters to this audience and why they should care and to get that right. And if you can do that and the audience agrees, yes, this is important to me, they will spend a lot of time and energy investing in whatever you have to say, um, even if you're not the strongest presenter. So that's true. On the other hand, it is also true that part of the way we assess the credibility of the data is by assessing the credibility of the presenter. And so being and projecting clarity and confidence about what you're presenting appropriately does influence how trustworthy people find the data. So the answer is the success is related to both of those things. And it is worth the time to get good at both of them. Then Keith asks, how would you tweak your presentation, if at all, in a pitch deck as a use case? And this is very hard to say without um, seeing the specific pitch deck, but the thing to remember here for pitch decks is to get clear about what this audience cares about, which is usually, can this business be successful? And can I make a return on this investment, which are two slightly different ideas, kind of a successful business that maybe someone couldn't make a return on, to get really clear about that. And then pitch decks tend to be very focused and have very high data to ink ratios. Mohammed asks, is that the same as a minimalist approach to design? Basically, yes. The data ink ratio does suggest a more minimalist approach to design. The only difference from minimalism is a high data ink ratio doesn't say get rid of all ink. It just says be deliberate about the ink that you use. Uh, Christine asks, how can you get your content to be visually engaging versus boring to look at? Um, I've seen a very, very simplistic slides with a ton of data, but just doesn't pull me in, want to read or retain it. The way you can get your content to be engaging is not actually grounded in the visuals. The way you get your content to be engaging is to be clear with the audience about why this matters to them and how it will impact their life. That's the most important thing. Then the next most important thing is to figure out what does this audience need to know and try to really focus on what they need to know. Not how do I get as much data as possible into the slide, how do I get them what they need to know? Those are the critical keys to being interesting. If people remember the beauty of your graphs, but don't remember what your message is, you have failed. If they don't remember your graphs at all, but remember your message, you have succeeded. Joseph asks, what about using non-data ink items such as photos to help with eliciting emotion into the story? Photos are data ink if 
they support the underlying message. This is where the concept gets confusing. So let's say, let me give you an example. Photos might be non-data ink. If your slide background has six different photos that are grayed out and always the same on every slide, that's not data ink. Um, if you are talking about a new skin graft procedure and you show a picture of that procedure, that's definitely data ink in that image. And then the example you talk about is, well, what if we're using it because we want to make an emotional point? Photos are a great way to make emotional points and they are data ink if the photo supports that emotional ink. The key is just to be deliberate. Um, I'm gonna go through a couple of these. Actually, we'll go to, um, to, to uh, Srinivasan. Um, can we see some examples of good data ink ratios? Well, I've tried throughout this presentation um, to, be, to be pretty good on that one. I think this one is reasonably good, not that it has no ink on it, but that every ink here serves a purpose. And I'm gonna go ahead and actually show an example here of one that actually has deliberately too much data ink on it. Oh, no, actually I was meant this, um, here's my one that I meant. Okay, let's start out with the bad example here. So if folks could go actually over into chat, see if you can identify as much excess ink on here as possible. Go on over into chat and just identify some excess ink. So we've got some coming in. Shadows, the bold lines around this boxes, the colors that are unnecessary, the grid lines, the numbers and the significant digits on here, all of the different colors, the decimal places, too many zeros. Great. Nice work. People are really calling this out. So let's take a look at this graph when we've cut out this non-data ink that people have identified here. This is the exact same data as before. Look at all the things I eliminated, all the things that you said. I've used the same color for all of the bars. I've pulled out the grid lines. I've reduced the significant digits on everything. I've, I've made the different elements of it in different fonts here. I'm not saying that this is perfect, but I am saying that at least this is a choice that tries to make all of the ink deliberate. And you can see if you compare it, how much clearer it is to be able to at least pull the data out of this. Nancy points out that there's some acronyms on here that people might not understand. And so this is a good example of how in the end, all of your choices are related to the audience. For instance, SS on here is meant to represent social studies. And some of you might interpret that differently. I thought that if this were an educational university audience, that they would probably know what that stood for in the context of a university department. But absolutely, if you move to a different audience, even like this general audience, probably people didn't recognize that. So eventually all of your choices have to be about who the audience is. And Tomek points out, um, that do we need these values up here if we have these on the y-axis? And no, you don't. If we were to take the values off the top of this, I can't do it easily here, but if we were to take the values off the top of this, it would emphasize the overall distribution of this data if we took away those numbers. If we took off the y-axis, then it would more emphasize the specific values of each of these bars. And you could imagine different conversations where you'd wanna emphasize different parts. You can imagine a conversation where maybe the shape of the data is most important. You wanna show the spread. You can imagine a different conversation where you really wanna talk about what's the average starting salary of an engineer out of undergraduate versus the average starting salary of a business major. How important is it include humor or fun in a presentation? I've used Dilbert to convey serious issues or discussions of a point. It's hard to say how much. Here's what I think is the highest standard you should, apply, you should try to do. The highest, in highest quality presentations, everything serves the purpose of the presentation. So humor is great, but it's best used when the audience will think that it's funny, which is a high standard and changes audience to audience. The first one, it has to be funny. The second one is if it relates to your topic. So a Dilbert cartoon could be great if it illustrates a concept 
that you want to talk about and that shows up in the presentation. If it's just there randomly to be funny, it might still work, but the highest level standard is actually using humor to support it. Ryan asks, are there particular tools you like for creating visualizations other than Excel? I believe the best tool is the one that you know the best. I have been using Excel for almost 25 years. So I almost exclusively use Excel because I know where every button in that software tool is. Um, and that's why I use it. Other people know other tools better and those are gonna be best. The key is knowing how to use whatever tool you use, not particularly the specific tool. Some things are easier than others. The last point that I wanna to get to if we close is the importance of visualizing all your comparisons explicitly. As I said, I'm on a quest for this in the world. So here's an example of a comparison that is not visualized explicitly. I've picked a headline here that says new product sales have been weak. And I see this all the time. You may think that line is a weak line, you may not, but it's actually not possible to evaluate whether or not new sales are weak because the thing we're comparing it to is not visualized here. The only thing that's visualized by this line is the sales compared, it compares the sales to themselves at an earlier point in time. Here's a visualized comparison. It shows what we should compare this line to, in this case, projected monthly sales. And we've made the comparison visual. Remember that audiences are always trying to evaluate, especially executive audiences, is this good or bad? Does this require attention or not? So think about visualizing goals, targets, averages, thresholds, tolerances. Often that's with lines or ranges um, or highlighted areas or shaded areas, things that show what this audience should compare the data to explicitly in order to be clear about what we're comparing. And this is hard because while this line is exact and easy to measure, this projection line is not exact, which can make it uncomfortable for data analysts. But I cannot emphasize enough how valuable it is to do this. If you show these lines, the conversation you will have is about whether we should be comparing the launch to this, the way we have projected it, rather than an argument about, is this line good or bad? It will focus the conversation in the right place. Rob surfacing a question. The exec ed program, you, um, um, he's, Rob is pointing out, so we'd have an exec ed program where we let you practice this. And if you're interested in it, you can see the link here to take the class. And in our open enrollment executive education class, we have people actually practice this and give each other feedback. Practice and feedback is critical for this skill because of the curse of knowledge. It's so hard for us to get outside our own heads and to see things from the audience's point of view. So my commitment to you is that we're gonna wrap on time. Um, and so I am gonna wrap up. There is a link to the class over in chat and we'll also put over a link to the book. But now you have a sense of how to identify the point of your slides and write it out as a headline. The importance of aiming for one idea at a time and why we can only see one at a time. How to think about maximizing the data ink ratio and make sure to visualize your comparisons explicitly, which requires you to think about how is this audience gonna judge good or bad, strong or weak. In my book, Persuading with Data, we go into even more detail about how to choose the right graph for the subject, even more ways to maximize the data ink ratio, how to create self-sufficient slides. And then we zoom out, I've even, even talked about this today, how to build clear and logical arguments, how to tell compelling data stories, how to deliver and how to deliver slides with confidence, as well as even how to handle challenging questions. So for folks interested in practicing more, um, you can buy the book, it's available at any major bookseller. This link will take you to some of the big ones or consider taking our online class. Our next version of it is in September, and the 15th and 16th, you get a free copy of the book if you register for that class. And you'll really get a chance to do structured practice of these skills. So 
I want to thank you all so much for being here today. I want to thank you all for the great and wonderful questions and your engagement. This is so much more fun when the questions are coming in. Um, I hope this has been of service to you and of value. Thank you so much. And Rob, I'll turn it over to you for some last words. Miro, thank you so much for packing so much helpful information into just one short hour. And I'm glad you were able to also um, finish with some of the additional resources, whether it's your book, whether it's your program that's running next in September or will run throughout the year as well. Uh, we hope that you, everybody that's joined us today has found this uh, very helpful and applicable to your, your, your lives, both your pre professional and your personal lives. I also wanna thank Eric and Elaine and our team here at MIT Sloan for uh, making sure that all the technology and everything ran smoothly. So we run these webinars uh, frequently throughout the year on a range of different topics. Again, we thank you for joining us today. We hope to see you back here either for uh, an online webinar or for one of our online programs that might be running or perhaps even on the MIT campus. So Miro, thanks again. Thank you all for joining and be well.